Yes, good morning. Good morning, online people also. How are you? Okay. So, let us let us begin the session number four and we'll wind up today by finishing off income from salaries and yeah, TDS also we'll do. Let's see. So, online people, can you hear me? All good? Cool. So, let's begin guys. Income from salary. Again, income from salary is very, very important chapter. 100% you will get questions from this area, undoubtedly. So, if I just browse through the syllabus, uh, house property we have done fully, and of course, with quite exhaustively, PGBP also, exhaustive discussion we have done, capital gains and other sources also, whatever. Capital gains we did very much in depth, in other sources, whatever important things, almost everything we covered actually. Yeah, clubbing of income is very simple, set off all these are very easy topics, chapter 6 say all that, I uh, will not have the time to do all those things, but of course TDS is again very important, so we need to do, uh, definitely around 4-5 marks will come, either in MCQ or normal stuff, then your return on income, all these are very easy guys, chiller stuff, you can do it on your own, Not my help is not so much needed here, but of course, again income from salary is uh, quite important, Apart from that, residential status also we finished uh, all the main areas except the income deemed occur in India. Apart from that, we did the full residential status as well. So, after all, you take all the five heads and then other masala items, then you will get what? The computation of total income. That is the final thing. Cool. So, let's begin income from salaries. So, let's go to that area. Yes, so section 15 talks about income from salaries. So there are two things. One is contract of service. One more is contract for service. The so contract of service is employment and contract for service will be consultancy that is PGBP. Whenever I use the word contract for service, it is all about PGBP. Contract of service on the other hand is contract of employment. So this is the employer-employee relationship has to be there always, undoubtedly. Uh, if anything that is earned by MLA, MLC, MP, all these things will come under income from other sources. Uh, salary, if you forego, sacrifice the salary also, that is also taxable. It's so stupid, but it is so. But if you surrender it to the central government, then only it is not taxable. So, your salary is 1 lakh per month, but you will say, no, no, don't want, don't pay me. Then that also, they, it, though it is not paid to you, still you have to pay tax on that. However, if you surrender it to the entire central, uh, to the money to the central government, then only it's not taxable because they have already got that money. So, forget about the 30 percent tax on it, they want the entire salary for themselves. So, obviously, they will not tax that. Then there are something called profit in lieu of salary, that is instead of salary, they will give other benefits, etc. Everything will be taxable for sure. So, basically, uh, the salary, you have many things that you need to uh, study one by one. That is your basic salary, dearness allowance, bonus commission, advance salary, so many things. One by one, we will see. So, what do you mean by basic? Basic is the normal basic salary that you get. So, basically, that is a component which they only derive. So, they uh, every company will have that this will be the basic, this will be the other allowances, this will be the other perquisites, etc. So, one by one. DA Dearness allowance will be fully taxable, undoubtedly fully taxable. Now, DA, there are two things. One, they will say DA in terms, DA not in terms. Dearness allowance, the word dearness means, dear means something which is going high. So, for example, in, in economics, you lose the word dear. So, if the cost is getting cheaper, opposite of cheaper is co cost is getting dearer. So, honestly speaking, dearness allowance is to beat inflation. Uh, it's not some any other dear that we know, right? So, it is dearness allowance. 
so fully taxable it is it's just a component to beat the rising prices that's it it is obviously fully taxable but if it is in terms means it will come under retirement benefit that's why it's called in terms so if it is in terms it will be part of the entire retirement benefit calculation if it is not in terms it will not be used in any calculation so in the exam you need to see whether they have given in terms or not in terms that's what it is uh they would have given in the exam so no problem so fully taxable that is 30000 in that 18000 is uh, let's say in terms 12000 is not in terms 18000 is used for computing the retirement benefits like pf and all those things anyway so those are all the uh, various things that we we'll have to see bonus and all that then if you see see the different form of salary all this we have done meaning of salary these things salary allowances perquisite gross salary deduction under section 16 and then income from salary will be the income from salary dearness allowance as we have discussed all already uh, okay if nothing is specified about the dearness allowance what will you assume that ta will not form of retire part of retirement benefits you can assume in the exam so bonus is what it is taxable only in the year of receipt if bonus is declared it is to be ignored it is only on receipt basis not on declaration basis commission it can either be given as a fixed amount or it can be given as a percentage of turnover you need to see that's all if they have given only percentage then please apply it on the turnover advance salary that is taxable in the year of receipt because you are receiving it first you need to tax it arrears of salary also definitely taxable in the year of receipt if not taxed earlier on due basis so definitely that also will be taxable only in the year of receipt retirement benefits will be what all these things you have gratuity we have pension we have leave encashment we have voluntary retirement service we have retrenchment compensation you have provident fund and all these areas now gratuity gratuity means what as the name suggest gratuity is from the word gratitude means to say thanks to the employee so that employee would have worked full time in the company for so long so to thank that person we have this concept of gratuity so gratuity there are two types gratuity received during the employment nobody will give gratuity during the employment so if at all you get during the employment it is obviously fully taxable whether you are a government employee or not a government employee fully taxable on the other hand if it is received at the time of retirement if it is received at the time of retirement towards the end then we have to see whether you are a government employee or other employees why do people always uh you know keep telling do you know join a government job join a government job it's because of this you'll get all these retirement benefits which are exempt fully exempt from tax government employee fully exempt under 1010 other employee there are two things one is if you are a poga employee poga means what payment of gratuity act means which means for you payment of gratuity will apply act will apply one more is payment of gratuity act will not apply then what part is exempt then this formula is there 15 by 26 into this as per payment of gratuity act anyway 15 by 26 this is like roughly half a month 26 is working days in a month or sunday you exclude so 15 by 26 is like 15 working days half working half half a month half a month of working month into salary per month into number of completed years of service it's like actually to be honest with you half month salary into number of years that you worked i'll give you grat gratitude this part is exempt or actual amount that you have received or 20 lakhs whichever is lower so if you have worked for 40 years at a salary of uh, let's say 20000 40000 rupees per month half salary will be 20000 20000 into 40 years how much it's actually whichever is lower is what you will get right and the salary per month monthly salary you should see into number of completed years of service then actual amount received or 20 lakh whichever is lower so sometimes you may get 25 lakhs also but ultimately we should decide whichever is lower that's how it is that is the payment of gratuity employee whichever is lower now what do you mean by salary here it says salary will i take all the salary no so here latest basic salary i should take latest means about when your time of retirement whatever you are earning that salary you should take and dearness allowance whether it is in terms or not in terms everything will come under this because i am talking about gratuity so salary per month this will come non poga employee on the other hand if you are a non poga employee payment of gratuity act will not uh, apply to you so instead of 15 by 26 they have directly used the word half it's almost the same only 
half into there it was salary per month here it is what average salary per month average salary per month into completed years of service into number of completed years of service second actual amount received third one 20 lakh whichever is lower whichever is lower so average salary is what average salary of last 10 months average salary of last 10 months is what you need to take average dearness allowance in terms of the last 10 months first is average basic salary of last 10 months second average dearness allowance which are in terms mind you of the last 10 months then average commission of the last 10 months average commission of the last 10 months so as i told you commission again will be passed of the turnover percentage of turnover of the last 10 months so here it is 10 months that is the average salary in Poga employee, it is latest basic salary at the time of retirement, what he was earning. Here it is average basic salary of the last 10 months. How will I compute average? I will take the full whatever basic salary average of the last 10 months. Then I will take the DA of the last 10 months. Then I will take commission of last 10 months. Divide by 10, divide by 10, everything. And only then I will get average salary per month. So, and here, interesting to know, I should exclude the month of retirement. So, if I am retiring in October, October I should exclude. I should take 10 months prior to that. Yes, half into average salary per month into number of completed years of service. Actual amount received or 20 lakh whichever is lower. And here it is what 15 by 26 into salary per month into number of completed years of service. Actual amount received or 20 lakh whichever is lower. Yes, and you should round off the year. How will you round off the year? In case of POGA, this is what? Number of completed years of service. Now, what if I have completed 35 years, 4 months? So, will I take it as 36 or will I take it as 35 is the question. So, interesting to know, in case of POGA, fraction which is more than 6 months should be rounded off to the next year and less than or equal to 6 months will be previous year. Fraction more than 6 months will be rounded off to the next year, less than or equal to 6 months will be previous year. Means, 35 years, 4 months will be deemed to be 35 years. 35 years, 7 months will be 36 years. This is for POGA employee. Non-POGA employee, whatever fraction, fully ignore. Means, even if I have worked for 35 years, 11 months, unfortunately, you should take it as 35 years. This is one of the benefits of being in Payment of Gratuity Act. You will get that extra benefit. So, salary is more of memory chapter, but very, very important chapter. So, just follow this structure, definitely you will understand everything. So, unfortunately, it's like, why is it 15 by 26, why not 16 by 27 and all, we don't know. Right? Actually, I genuinely tried. All those books you see there, I've read everything. In that books, I've seen why they have given like that. These are all commentary by amazing authors. It's a very, very good set of books. Right? So, the thing is, there I tried searching. I, I, mean, I wanted to know the logic because if any student does, I cannot say I don't know. But this genuinely I don't know because I have searched everywhere. Nowhere they have told the logic of why 15 by 26. Then I only tried to figure out. Five days, uh, Sunday they would have taken and whatever and 15. They wanted to take half a month, half working month. But that logic, nowhere it's given. Even in the commentary, generally every word they have given the history of every word. So all these other things that I told you is all from that book only actually. So that is my job, no? to condense everything and make it into a structured format. That is my job. Your job is to remember. But this logic I genuinely tried, couldn't find anywhere to be honest. So you need to, of course, but, but basically they are trying to, the basis was what the basis is given there. The basis what they were trying to tell was at least like half month salary into whatever number of years you completed, you should take it into account. And also since you are POCA, I will give you this benefit if it's more than six months, I will run it off to the next year is what they have told. So apart from this, this these two are the same, only the first item changes. So, in the exam, they will give you whether it's POCA employee, non-POCA employee, all the things they will only give. So, rounding off, yes. So, for example, 24 years, 8 months in POCA will be 25, in non-POCA, 24. 24 years, 3 months in POCA and non-POCA, 24. 24 years, 6 months, since it's not more than 6, POCA it is 24, non-POCA anywhere it is 24. Right, so that is what it is, very simple. That is regarding gratuity. Next, going on to pension. Pension. Pension is of two types. Uncommuted pension 
second one is commuted pension uncommuted pension then commuted pension uncommuted pension means what commutation means where i can take a lump sum amount so if you are an employee you can say 50% i want lump sum remaining 50% i want monthly no problem so i'll ask you if i want to do 100% withdrawal how much it will be they'll say 1 crore i'll say no no i don't want 1 crore give me 50% 50 lakhs give me now remaining 50 lakhs spread across till i die yes government employees after the death also the family will get the pension reduced pension that's why people die for government jobs so uncommuted pension monthly taxable for all employees government and non government but then in government employees will not earn much in terms of salary etc but they'll mint money through bribes anyway so uncommuted pension monthly pension that is taxable for all employees government and non government commuted pension is what sir so uncommuted pension whatever you are getting monthly whether you are government employee non government employee it is fully taxable it's like normal commuted pension lump sum lump sum payment i remember for my dad we did the calculation when he was 60 years we commuted i think uh, 60% because that fully exempt was a government employee but now he is getting i think some 1 and 1/2 lakhs every month that is uncommuted should he pay tax on that yes uncommuted pension monthly taxable for all employees commuted pension lump sum exempt under 10 10a government employee fully exempt non government employee if the gratuity is received what to do gratuity is not received what to do if the gratuity is received then total pension into 1/3 total pension into 1/3 will be what the exempt portion if gratuity why because if gratuity is not received then it is half why because since gratuity is already received already benefit has taken there so here i'll give less benefit what is the less benefit total pension into 1 by 3 if gratuity is not received then total pension into 1 by 2 the total pension is full value of pension that is amount received per divided by percentage of commutation so that's basically i have to make the full value of pension here here whenever i said total pension full value of pension so they'll say the amount received was whatever it is and for this percentage was commuted so if 30 per, the amount received uh, is 30% of commutation what is 100% so you should cross up that's all if they say 1 lakh rupees have received that is 20% of the uh, entire pension i should do for 100% how much so 1 lakh divided by 0.2 that is what i should do totally 5 lakhs it will come 5 lakh will be my total pension very simple so that is regarding pension so pension always note uncommuted pension it is always taxable for all the employees only commuted pension it is taxable to on the few what do you say it is exempt on a 10 10a for government employees and for non government i should see whether you have received gratuity or not received gratuity next concept is leave salary leave salary is encashment of unutilized leave in every company you will get at least around 20 25 days off in a year apart from your other leaves that other leaves is your holidays and all those things that is anyway 20 25 days apart from that you can also take you know casual leave 20 days sick leave 10 days like that depends from company to company uh, saturday sunday anyway will not be working so roughly will be working around maybe perhaps Uh, in that weekends only you remove 100 days will go there only because saturday sunday generally people don't work so 52 weeks 100 days gone there only so 250 days plus 30 40 days more you will get so sometimes you just work 200 days 220 days etc so yes uh, when you join an audit firm or when you join a big four which is only into audit profession that is your assurance team then saturday sunday there will be no days every day is audit day right that's the problem so you will tend to think that i studied so much for what to die in the office right that's the feeling that you will get but if you are into tax also you will be working full out but your entire life or entire life is working only guys think about it so it is all working and earning for something which we can't even spend it's the best part and still you are doing ca god bless you yes but it's good because you will get that freedom to do whatever the hell you want that is the best part of doing this ca definitely so encashment of unutilized leave not just ca whatever you do it's all about working on you know think about it yes encashment of unutilized leave so received during the employment taxable for 
all employees encashment of unutilized leave received during the employment it is taxable for all employees now this is some fellows if they don't take that leave work colleagues will be there their entire life will be only working so there was in lnt one guy mental fellow 30 or uh, 35 years he worked one leave also hasn't taken so he had accumulated leave of some like 200 days or something so he got something in crores of money right the man good for him because for him he is just a work colleague he just wanted to work and nothing else of course he reached that level now he became like director of lnt and all that anyway so received during the employment it is taxable for all employees but generally will get at the end of the retirement term of retirement government employee you see again fully exempt most of them during work also they will not work anyway so but uh, leave also they will not take yes so it is fully exempt other employees now least of the following is exempt least of the following so what is that leave credit in terms of months what is leave credit leave allowed minus leave taken so if leave allowed is 30 days for every year what is the leave taken 20 days so what is the credit that you are getting 10 days if some companies actually have leave credit 40 days also i cannot take 40 minus 20 i should take 30 only because depends from company to company leave allowed so income tax act says maximum 30 days if in your company only 20 days is allowed then 20 but in your company 40 days is allowed no don't take 40 only 30 so that's why maximum 30 days for every completed year minus leave taken so you, that will be your credit if leave taken is zero full 30 days credit you will get so leave credit into average salary per month so average salary per month means what same as gratuity non poga average basic last 10 months average da terms last 10 months average turnover commission last 10 months if they have given any other commission should not take in calculation it should only be turnover commission the previous one also here also same it is as gratuity non poga case So what is the average salary? Ten months into average salary per month, actual amount received, or there it was twenty lakh. Now in gratuity here it is three lakh. But here it is ten months into average salary per month. Average salary is the same calculation. So I should do four items. One is leave credit, that is the thirty days into average salary per month, and then ten months into average salary per month, and actual amount received and maximum amount three lakh rupees. This is the portion of leave salary so anything they can ask you guys that is the problem anything we have to be ready with each and everything now next and apart from that you will also get some other funds here we will see pension done leave salary done provident fund you see before that one more are you salary done a retrenchment compensation retrenchment compensation means what retrenchment means where they will ask you to leave retrenchment means where they will ask you to leave basically retrenchment is like retirement only forced retirement for post retirement i'll give you some compensation if it is scheme of central government exempt other cases lower of 5 lakh or actual amount received or as per the industrial disputes act 1947 whichever is lower you will get compensation as per industrial disputes act also same guys you see like poga 15 by 26 into average salary of last 3 months into number of completed years of service same it is and uh, vrs also we will see little later no problem uh, provident fund provident fund there are two types ppf public provident fund then epf employer provident fund if it's a public provident fund that is ppf no need of employer employee relationship even you and i can uh, invest in employee uh, sorry in the public provident fund there is no need of employer employee relationship but If it is employer employee relationship is there that is called EPF employer provident fund. So in that there are three things SPF statutory provident fund, RPF recognized provident fund and URPF unrecognized provident fund. Statutory provident fund is set up under the PF Act 
RPF recognized provident fund set up under EPF Act 1925 recognized by Commissioner of Income Tax. URPF unrecognized provident fund is neither statutory provident fund nor recognized provident fund. Generally, if contribution made to unrecognized provident fund also in PGBP, it is what? It is not allowed. This allowed because anything which is unrecognized cannot be taken into account. These two will be taken into account. Statutory provident fund. Now, one by statutory provident fund is only applicable to whom? Government employees, semi-government institutions, local authority, university, etc. Employer contribution fully exempt. So, in a statutory provident fund or recognized provident fund, two people will contribute. One employer, one employee. Employer's contribution fully exempt. Employee's contribution, it is taxable but eligible for deduction under ATC. And the interest also that you are getting out of this contribution will be exempt. And towards the end, whenever you retire, they will recover that money from you, from that, sorry, from that fund and pay you. All these years you have been deducting and paying to the government, to the fund and that fund money, whatever investment, etc., everything will be given to you. That is fully exempt for government employees. This is one of the reasons why government employees always say, I mean, people always say join government service because all these extra benefits you will be getting, which you will not get in normal uh, private companies. Uh, next is RPF, Recognized Provident Fund. The Recognized Provident Fund is recognized by whom? By the principal, what do you say, commissioner or chief commissioner, principal commissioner or in all those things, they will be under this scheme provided. Now here, what is the general rule? Employer's contribution up to 12% of salary is exempt for the employee. When I say exempt for whom? Obviously for the employee. Right? Up to 12% of his salary. If it is more than 12%, then it will be taxable for the employee. Why? Because up to 12%, the government will say, okay, no problem. But the moment you pay more than 12% from your pocket, employer pays from his pocket more than 12%, then it will now be taxed in the hands of the employee. As what? This will be like more like a extra benefit. So it will be taxable. Employee contribution. So basically, if uh, 1 lakh is the salary, 10,000 rupees assume employer is paying on his own extra. 10,000 rupees they are deducting from employee. So, 1 lakh minus 10,000, 90,000 goes to employee. Minus, of course, TDS and all that you leave. 90,000 is the amount minus TDS. TDS also to deduct, no? So, anyway, but this 10,000 is 10%, 10 so no problem. This 10,000 is also no problem. Now, the question to the employee is, employee in his account, in his uh, tax return, will show full 1 lakh, obviously. And then on that, we will compute tax, definitely, yes. But in that, he has already paid 10,000 to, uh, he would have paid some tax that he will reduce, no problem. But he would have paid this 10,000 to the uh, PF authority. So, for that also, if you pay time, if you, you know, may, uh, say that tax is there, then it's a problem. That is why there's a deduction available under ATC, tax reduction. Any employee contribution, it is taxable definitely, but eligible for deduction. So, what will you do? 1 lakh you add to the full salary which is taxable, then subtract 10,000, which is ATC. Employer's contribution up to 12% of salary exempt, any excess taxable. Employee's contribution taxable but eligible for deduction under section ATC. Then you will get interest on provident fund and you get interest up to 9.5% per annum, it is exempt. Anything which is excess will be taxable. Anything excess will be taxable. Any lump sum amount that you finally receive in the end, lump sum amount is exempt under 1011 if the four conditions are satisfied. Condition number one, employee should have left the job only after five years of service. 
less than five years if you leave and if you take out the pf what will happen taxable second employee has left the job before completing five years only either due to his ill health or the company the business only closed down so obviously you cannot penalize me so first condition second condition third condition fourth one let's say you joined somewhere else no problem from this pf account you should transfer to that new company's pf account then it's okay so balance in the rpf is transfer to new employee new employer sorry and period with the old employer plus new employee employer should be more than 5 years then it's okay no problem yes in my under 115 bac you will not get atg atc and all those things correct then exemption allowed if conditions are not satisfied if conditions are not satisfied then exemption allowed earlier will be withdrawn so that interest on employees contribution towards spf etc earlier there used to be exemption for interest also but now it will not be available in respect of income by way of interest accrued during the previous year to the extent it relates to the amount of contributions made by an employee exceeding 250000 in any previous year on or after 1 4 so this is for what interest portion on employees contribution earlier it used to be exempt here as i told you now it is not exempt it's an amendment so they say if the contribution so basically here pf account taxable contribution amount non taxable contribution amount what is the non taxable contribution accumulated balance as on 31 321 it is grandfathered i will not touch that so interest accrued on a and b above that is employer's contribution employee's contribution everything will not be no tax on that but contribution made by c in the account during previous year and subsequent previous year in excess of 250000 In excess of two lakh fifty thousand, interest accrued on A above will be definitely taxed. Be taxed. Now this is assuming employer also contributed. What is employer hasn't contributed? Can you see here? Contribution by such employee is in a fund which when there is no employer contribution, then a higher limit of five lakh will be applicable. So if the employer doesn't contribute only. then how much will you get up to 5 lakh no tax this is interest on 5 lakh mind you interest beyond 5 lakh will be taxing this is the interest on the contribution amount which contribution employee contribution this interest is what this interest is interest on the entire pf account this will include both employer and employee contribution so there it is up to 5.9.5% exempt beyond that taxable unrecognized provident fund as i told you is definitely employer's contribution is exempt employee's contribution why is employer's contribution exempt for the employee because for the when i say exempt it is for whom i am exempt for the employee why because unrecognized provident fund for the employer will be disallowed under section 40 there is a section called 40a7 40a9 and all these things if you give it to this is not there for you actually it's more for ca final in those sections only basics is given for you but in ca final full in depth is there so what i am trying to tell is if an employer uh, deposits money to unrecognized provident fund government says disallowed disallowed means what add back to the profit which means who has to pay tax employer has to pay tax when employer has already paid tax for employee it is exempt that's why fully exempt employee's contribution fully taxable no deduction no deduction under atc also nothing interest okay i'll exempt you no problem but what will be taxed deadly lump sum amount received on retirement employer's contribution imagine whatever the employer had contributed fully taxable for you 
interest on employer's contribution fully taxable actually guys there is double taxation here first taxation employer would have paid then after retirement double taxation employee will pay that's why nobody will go for unrecognized this is actually to discourage people from investing in unrecognized provident fund because in unrecognized provident fund you can invest in wherever you want equity shares all high risk investments but in recognized provident fund there, there are rules by the pf authority you should invest only in risk free investments because it is the hard earned money of the employee on the other hand the lump sum that you receive on employee's contribution is not taxable why because employee has already paid before has already paid before interest on employee's contribution that is also taxable under ifos so if you ever we are stupid enough to invest in unrecognized provident fund everywhere taxation there is absolutely no point in doing so so unrecognized fund means a fund not recognized by commissioner of income tax then we have something called as superannuation fund so employer's contribution is exempt this we'll see later leave it this we'll see later so let's go on to allowances so allowances we have many things one is fully exempt allowances that is this then fully taxable allowances then partly exempt allowances then exemption is equal to the amount that you have spent some of the exemptions will be only till the amount that you have spent you have daily allowance traveling allowance conveyance allowance helper allowance uniform allowance academy allowance all these allowances you will get exemption to the amount that you have spent if they have given you 200 rupees you have spent 200 rupees fully exempt uniform allowance is for these companies which has uniforms right your uh, hindustan aeronautics limited has uniform many companies would have seen will have uniform so stupid fellows what they do is for children's uniform and all they'll take uniform allowance actually practically that's not at all correct uniform allowance is for the person's uniform then uh, partly exempt is house rent allowance hra and other special allowances under 1014 we'll see fully taxable is allowances which are not covered under any other category fully fully this thing taxable and basically it's useless only that allowance to have because anyway it's taxable fully exempt is allowance to high court judges is fully exempt for them allowance received from united nations is fully exempt allowance granted to government employees working outside india they are all fully exempt for them so as far as allowances are concerned some important ones here first one commutation allowance commutation means traveling transport allowance this is only for the blind deaf and handicapped 3200 rupees per month is exempt so unfortunately you have to remember all these things but only few are there not a lot so it's fine you can try and manage so that is 3200 maximum per month exempt children education allowance children education allowance maximum 100 rupees per month per child you can't have cricket team maximum two children right 100 rupees it peanuts like this was all there in 1960s 70s it doesn't even make sense 100 rupees per month per child what is 100 rupees in this day and age they should remove all these things don't make that that also why you should simply sit and remember but it's painful for us only right no choice children hostel allowance maximum 300 rupees per child this is hostel allowance and maximum two children so hostel more education less underground allowance that is for mining etc mining it is 800 rupees per month tribal area allowance if you are now working in a tribal area tribal zone 200 rupees per month allowance for employees of transport undertaking that is your truck drivers for truck drivers amount received into 70% or 10000 rupees per month whichever is less so 70% or 10000 rupees per month whichever is less will come there this is for transport undertakings hill compensatory allowance hill compensatory allowance means what if you are working in hilly areas 300 rupees per month notified areas some notified hills 
800 rupees per month and siachen glacier all our army men who are working till it's very less for them but anyway unfortunately just 7000 rupees per month it is a life and death situation there yes apart from that all these other things traveling on tour allowance conveyance allowance uniform allowance daily allowance helper allowance helper allowance means office boy not servant at home mind you servant at home will be fully taxable for quiz it will become this is office boy and research allowance it's called academy allowance all these things is exempt only to the extent of the amount that has been spent nothing else all the bills against bills you should give bills for all these things and for, for our armed forces counter insurgency allowance of armed forces operating in area away from the permanent location so immediately if there's some terrorist attack the army will deploy the people jawans there so for them 3900 rupees per month high altitude allowance this is not siachen glacier other glaciers 9000 to 15000 feet 1060 more than 15000 feet 1600 per month special compensatory highly active field area allowance where lot of terrorist activities are going on 4200 rupees per month island duties that is in andaman nicobar lakshadweep etc 3200 rupees per month is the allowance that you will get these are the allowances which are what do you say exempt to this extent next comes house rent allowance hra house rent allowance hra that is under 1013a these are partly exempt or fully exempt partly exempt how much this you have to remember because they keep asking hra 40% of 50% of salary is exempt up to least of the following 40 or 50% of salary what is salary basic plus da if if it comes in the terms plus commission based on turnover and 40% 50% depends 40% with other cities 50% with metropolitan cities only four metropolitan cities are there mumbai delhi kolkata chennai no bangalore is not there right so that's why recently this guy or uh, mp tejasvi surya he made a petition to the uh, in the parliament saying that bangalore is a metropolitan city in all sense of the term but unfortunately since 1970s income tax act has not been amended so he actually said please make it i mean it's actually you also know it is one of the largest cities in india so add it to the metropolitan city because earlier the entire capital of the entire southern region was chennai so that they took there then delhi is anyway there western part we had mumbai and the other part we had kolkata that they had done in 1960s and they have not changed only what why he was petitioning is because people now can claim 50% in hra rather than 40% that is the reason why he was pushing so basic plus da if plus commission is on turnover actual amount received rent paid minus 10% of salary rent paid minus 10% of salary and what is salary basic salary plus da if it comes part of the terms plus commission based on turnover and for salary advance salary should not be taken advance salary should not be taken basic plus da if plus commission which is based on the turnover commission which is based on the turnover 50% metropolitan then other cities nothing so this you will get whatever rent allowance that you are getting minus these three things 40% or 50% of salary actual amount received or rent paid minus 10% of salary again salary means what basic plus da if plus commission which is passed out the part of the turnover then let's see then you have something called perquisite let us see one second so other special allowances we have seen already transport allowance children education hostel counter insurgency all that we have seen next comes the interesting area of perquisites if i see perquisites some perquisites are taxable in all cases some perquisites are taxable only in the hands of specified employees and some perquisites are not taxable at all like medical facilities uh, will not be taxable leave travel concession not taxable other things will not be taxable taxable in all cases rent free accommodation butcher employee rfa is taxed 
Accommodation provided at concessional rent, it will be taxed. Obligation of employee met by employer means employee had to pay that amount, but employer paid now. Like for example, children's school fees, employer paid directly. Of course, I have to pay. So, of course, that will be taxed. Amount payable to affect insurance. Insurance policy paid by employer on behalf of employee. ESOP or sweat equity. So, even if you are getting ESOP or sweat equity, it is taxed. Contribution to superannuation fund and other fringe benefits like free meals, interest free concession loan, traveling, touring, accommodation, gift, credit card, club facility, use of mobile assets and all these things. Not taxable medical facility, leave travel concession, others. So, if you see one by one, LTC, leave travel concession. Travel benefit across India, this is what all you will get. If you are traveling by air, if you are traveling by air, what is exempt? Actual expenses is exempt. Economy class fare is exempt. Either of the two. Either you will get the actual expenses or air ticket economy class. Because there are three classes, economy business and first class. So, here you will only get up to economy class. If you go for other things, you have to pay. Basically, that extra will be taxable. Other mode, other than airway, it can either be railway or railway facility not available. If railway facility is available, then actual expenses or first class AC railway fare. First class AC railway fare, whichever is less, you will get first class AC. We have three tire AC, two tire AC, first class AC, like that. Travel facility not available. Travel facility not available. Then I should see whether recognized transport facility is available or recognized transport facility not available. If recognized transport facility is available, what is exempt? Actual expenses or deluxe class bus fare. Which means if bus is there or deluxe class, whatever bus fare, deluxe class you will get, whichever is less. So, if nothing is available, you want to go to Himalayas and then do meditation there. So, there, there is very no motorable road at all. You know, some hilly area you want to go. Then they will say actual expenditure or first class railway fare of similar distance. If that distance is 80 kilometers or uh, 800 kilometers, same or some 600 kilometers, similar. Same distance, what will be the air, uh, sorry, this uh, railway fare that you will get exemption. Beyond that, if you are getting, that will be a benefit and it will be taxable. So, if I am spending, the company is giving 1 lakh rupees LTC, leave travel concession, but actually the economy fare is only 80,000, 20,000 will be taxable. Which one? Aha. Yeah, of course, all the bus facilities it will include. The government bus facilities, yes, definitely. And you will get only for two years, not every year. Two years in a block of four years. Two years in a block of four years, you will be getting all these things. Now, this is for the entire family. Now, family means not your extended family, two, two spouses and all of you have, that is not covered. It is only SSE plus spouse, plus children and dependent relative. Dependent relative will be your parents and your siblings. That's it. That to dependent means what? Financially dependent, not emotionally dependent. Financially dependent parent. That's it. Then, two children. Children also not some 11, 10, 9. It's only two children. And that too, born after 1st October 1998. Born after 1st October 1998. Two children. Now the thing is, on 1st October 2000, one child was born. And on 10th November 2002, twins were born. So it's considered as three or two. 3. This also they clarified. Considered as 3. So that one extra child not allowed. 
other on the other hand on 1st october 2000 twins came and then on 10th november 2002 one child was born what do you think will you take it as one or two c ltc you come to rfa what do you think you will take it as two or one Yeah, the exemption shall not be available to more than two surviving children of an individual born on or after 1st October 1998. If the SSE after 1st October 1998 had one child and thereafter twins in 2001, exemption shall be avail available to all three children. It will be considered as three, but it will be available to all three. Because you had one child and then twins came. So those twins though it is considered two, it will be deemed to be one for tax purposes. So, for, though it is considered as three only, for all three it is allowed. On the other hand, that is what I have written here. 110-2000, one child. Of 10-9-2002, twins. So, one plus two taken as three only and exemption is allowed to all the three. On the other hand, on 110-2000, twins were born. It is already two. 10th September 2002, one was born. Not considered only. So, it is only these two people will be considered. Very, very simple. This is for leave travel concession. Leave travel concession. Next, medical facility. Medical facility. I should see whether treatment is in India or treatment outside India. Treatment is in India. If it is in a government hospital and that too happens to be employer's hospital or government recognized hospital, whatever it is, either government hospital or government I mean the employer's hospital is own hospital like Reliance or this MS Ramaya or the employees of MS Ramaya have their own hospital anyway and government recognized hospital then fully exempt but if the treatment is somewhere else in a private hospital then fully taxable treatment outside India treatment outside India treatment or the stay both exempt up to the limit prescribed by RBI it is exempt up to the limit prescribed by RBI and for travel it is fully exempt limit prescribed by RBI is what as per the liberalized remittance scheme of PEMA it is two lakh fifty thousand dollars per annum so for treatment and stay it is exempt up to the limit prescribed by RBI that is two lakh fifty thousand dollars per annum but travel on the other hand it is fully exempt travel it is fully exempt if your gross total income is less than or equal to 2 lakh without adding this travel benefit else for traveling it will be fully taxable no doubt about it fully taxable this is the medical facility this is not medical uh, what do you say uh, reimbursement of medical expenses it is medical facility given where they will only give you the facility they will only pay employer will pay so for treatment and stay if employer is paying you know it's exempt but for traveling etc only if your income is less than or equal to 2 lakh nobody will pay you if your income is just less than or equal to 2 lakh obviously so for generally for travel for all employees it will be fully taxable Perquisite number three, gift to employee. Gift if it is given in cash, fully taxable. Gift if it is given in kind. If fair market value is less than 5,000, fully exempt. If fair market value is greater than or equal to 5,000, fully taxable. Then you have ESOP, Employee Stock Option Plan. These are the shares issued at concessional rate. So, generally there will be an employee and I will tell you, you work for 3 more years. If you work for 3 more years, uh, 20 lakh worth of, uh, what do you say, the shares I will give you at 10 lakh, I will give you at 5 lakh, whatever. So, that 3 years that you are working, that is called as the vesting period. At the end of the vesting period, you will have an option to buy the shares. So, you can either exercise the option or you can choose not to exercise the option. 
So what is taxable? What is taxable amount for the employee? FMB of the shares on the date you are exercising the option minus issue price. So if the FMB of the shares was 20 lakhs, issue price was only 5 lakhs. How much is taxed? 15 lakh is taxed undoubtedly. And FMB of the shares will take the opening rate and closing rate divided by 2. Otherwise valuation will be done. This is regarding ESOP. So basically when I say ESOP, don't jump and say oh, everything is free. It's not free. First of all, you will pay 5 lakhs. And then 20 minus 5 on 15 lakh, 30% you have to pay anyway. 4.5 lakhs gone. So what is the effective cost of a 20 lakh share? 9.5 lakh, including tax. So it's not so beneficial, of course, but there will be some discount, there is 50% in this example. Next, loan given to employee. Now loan can be given to employee with interest or without interest, doesn't matter. Or concessional interest also. Taxable perquisite, if I am giving it at a concessional amount, then loan amount into SBI rate as on 1st April of previous year. Please note, it is not the SBI rate as on date of giving the loan. They can confuse you by giving all those things. They can give you on the date of the loan, rate of interest SBI was 14%. But on 1st April of previous year, that is 1st April 22, rate of interest was 12%. I should actually take 12%. SBI rate as on 1st April of previous year minus actual rate of interest. So, I am going to tax on what? The extra amount that you have received. Loan amount into SBI rate is 14%. They have given you at 8%. 6% benefit they have given. I will tax that benefit also. So you will have to pay 30% of 6% actually. That is 1.8% you have to pay. So basically, Nirmala Aunty will squeeze you from everywhere. If you are a salaried employee. The only way you can save money is if you are a businessman. We have our presumptive taxation and all those things. So that is what it is. Uh, but if the loan amount is less than or equal to 20,000, then not taxable. That also they can ask you in an MCQ. If the loan amount is less than or equal to 20,000, then benefit of interest not taxable. I repeat, don't go on the date of employee releasing the loan, go by previous year, yes. And also guys, if the loan is given for specified diseases treatment, cancer, AIDS and all those other things are there, you know, very deadly diseases, then not taxable. So interest benefit is not taxable for loan given for specified diseases. Next, perquisite number 6, use of movable asset. One is what? Computer, laptop. Imagine the Nirmala auntie taxing you for laptop given to you by your office. Deadly. With that laptop only, you will go hit everybody. Right? So, if you see, it's fully exempt. Thankfully. Right? Next, car, we will see next part. Next, any other asset. Furniture, sofa, bottle. Bottle also, not kidding, right? Technically speaking, nobody does all that practically, but it actually it is taxable. They will give, give you one bottle for use, that also is taxable. Furniture, sofa, etc. Now, next, owned by employer. If furniture is owned by employer and sent to your house, where you can use that, it's, they have given you 
you know you rent your own house i'll give you some three four furniture yes many arrangements are there like that what is the taxable amount 10% of the cost if they have hired so there's a company called furlenko where you can hire uh, you know furniture and all etc so they will hire from furlenko and give you then it is higher charges paid by employer will be your taxable perquisite this is your use of mobile asset mind you car we will see later next one is what sale of mobile asset computer laptop you will use for 2 3 years then you will purchase that as an employee yes it is taxable wdv minus consideration is taxable so wdv is 1 lakh consideration is 1 lakh zero tax wdv should be computed not as per income tax 40% normal you know your wdv here they have given 50% specific rate is given already so if you see laptop was 1 lakh rupees used for 2 years employed paid 5000 not a taxable perquisite 1 lakh minus 5000 50000 50000 again 50% 25000 25000 the wdv how much do you sell it for? Buy it for 5,000. 25,000 minus 5,000, 20,000 will be my taxable value. If it is car, I am per selling the car to you after usage, WDV minus consideration, depreciation at 20% WDV method. Other asset, WDV minus consideration, WDV 10% at SLM method. And mind you, life is considered as 10 years directly. No change. It is considered as 10 years. For whom? For other assets, furniture and all those things. SLM, that's why 10%. No, that's why life is considered as 10 years. Most important thing, depreciation should be calculated for completed year. From the date on which employer acquired till the date of sale to the employee if it is 10 and a half months etc ignore 10 and a half years sorry ignore three and a half years that half year ignore two and a half years half year ignore completed year of service Other asset taxable WDV minus consideration. Depreciation at 10% SLM method. Life is considered as 10 years. So here same thing. Depreciation per year you should take at 10% SLM. Direct SLM mind you not WDV. Next lunch facility. Exempt if value of the meal is 50 rupees per meal. Chaprasi, 50 rupees. Provided an office campus, paid voucher, that is Sodexo coupon and all those things. Sodexo coupon, you will get. If value is more than 50, excess is taxable. Nobody uses this practically, guys, but theory they will give. 50 rupees. Next, ninth perquisite, rent-free accommodation, housing facility, rent-free accommodation. Government employee taxable as per the license fee. So, this is what they have only given you rent, free accommodation, house facility. So, if it's a government employee, generally they used to get this taxable as per the license fee decided by government. It is given in the question always. That is a taxable perquisite. Then that will be some peanuts, 50 rupees, 20 rupees like that. 20 rupees per month, 50 rupees per month, not kidding. We stayed always in government facility only because my dad was in the government service, always government quarters. This will be shitty homes, but then no choice. That is how government provided. Only later stage when obviously dad rose up in the ranks, then those houses were huge. Like only like four people are living in some huge house, some 120 by 120 site. It had one garden where you can play cricket there. Correct? So it was like that. But of course, when you see this license fee, no, 50 rupees, 80 rupees, 
like that. These are all the benefits of government employees, of course. Other employee, uh, house is owned by employer or hired by employer. If it's hired by employer, very simple, guys. We'll see that. Uh, if it is owned by employer, if it is owned by employer, then taxable amount is how much? 7.5%, 10.5% or 15% of basic allowance, all taxable allowances, DA, which are in terms commission, all types of commission, any bonus or any monetary income that is salary other than perquisites. What is a monetary income other than perquisites, etc.? Whatever you are getting other than perquisites, that is your overtime allowance and all those things that will be taken into account. This is if you you are another employee, private employee, house is owned by the employer, he is giving you that to stay for free. You still have to pay tax. How much? 7.5% or 10% or 15% of salary. What is salary here? Basic, basic salary, taxable allowance, allowances uh, or taxable allowances. Then DA, if it comes in terms, then commission, all types, whether normal commission, turnover commission, anything. Then other monetary income other than perquisites, like overtime allowance, then bonus. That will be the concept here. What is 7.5, 10%, 15%? If the population is up to 10 lakhs, 7.5%. 10 lakh, 25 lakh, 10%. More than 25 lakh, 15%. Always given in the question. All of these things will be given in the question. Nothing to worry. But you need to remember all these things. Basic, allowance, DA, then uh, commission, all types, monetary income, bonus. This is if the house is owned by employer. If house is rented by employer, then taxable amount will be least of the following. 15% of the same thing or higher charges paid by employer. As I told you, salary chapter is more mugging up than anything. Unfortunately, but no choice. But these charts will definitely help you clear, I mean, at least remember stuff. If furniture is also provided, then if it is owned by employer, 10% of cost. Hired by employer, higher charges by employee. Advanced salary should not be taken. And this entire concept of DMC, BBA, etc. calculated for the time for which SSC has occupied the house and not for the full year. Not for the full year. It is only for the time which you have occupied, not for the full year. Retirement benefit should not be considered here. Gratuity, pension, leave, salary, etc. should not be considered. That is what it is. This is perquisite. Number 9. 10 hotel benefit. If they have given you a hotel to stay, what is the taxable benefit of that hotel that you are staying? 24% of salary. 24% of salary. Which sort of salary? Same. Bonus, taxable allowances, TA fits in terms, same thing. Or higher or rent charges paid by employer, whichever is less. So they have given you a hotel to stay in, 24% of salary or higher charges or rent paid, whichever is less you have to take. If employer recovers rent from employee, then that rent should be subtracted from the taxable amount because you are not providing rent free accommodation, you are collecting some rent. If hotel facilities provided at the time of transfer of employee, it is not, it is up to 15 days, then it is not taxable. So, up to 15 days, whatever hotel facility is provided, no problem. Because 15 days is the time for you to shift to the new house. So, there, no tax is collected, not a problem. This is just the concise version of the entire salary chapter. All the things are covered in this. Perquisite number 12, transport facility for transport employee. That is your free tickets. Airline tickets, railway tickets, no tax. For other employees, fully taxable less amount recovered. So, if you are a normal private employee, they are giving you free transport, air tickets or not for your leave, but for your other things, then it is fully taxable less amount recovered. Education facility. For employee, it is fully exempt. If they are giving you education facility for education of the employee, then for the employee fully exempt. Employees' children with the value of education is less than or equal to 1000 rupees per month per child. Exempt if education is provided in employer's own institute or other, any other tie-up if it's there. Other schools where there is no tie-up, fully taxable. 
for any other relatives fully taxable it's anyway useless and that to what thousand rupees per month where where it is impossible now for nursery only it's a one lakh or something right yes car facility car facility i told you car we will discuss later now car is fully used for official purposes exempt if employer maintains records of each journey car used for fully personal purposes taxable value if car is owned by the employer and then given to the employee 10% of the cost is taxable car is hired by the employer then higher charges you should do apart from that you add the driver salary add running and maintaining expenses that will be the taxable perquisite if car is used pa partly for office partly for person this is how it will be generally it cannot be okay it can be some official definitely or it can be fully personal doubtful it can be mix of this it is mixed if car is owned by employee but running and maintaining charges are paid by the employer see if car is owned by employee employee only is paying everything then what taxable not taxable if car is owned by employee running and maintaining expenses also paid by employee there is no benefit only and it's not taxable but if car is owned by employee but the company says i will pay your service cost i will pay your petrol i will pay everything don't worry then actual amount paid by employer minus 1800 rupees per month or 2400 rupees per month depending upon the cc that amount will be taxable all this we have to remember guys no choice but if car is owned by employer they own the car and they will tell employee you need to pay petrol charges then employee how much he has to pay 600 rupees per month or 900 rupees per month depending on the cc but if they paid by employer only then extra you need to pay 1800 per month or 2400 rupees per month if driver is provided and paid by employer extra 900 rupees per month will be added to taxable amount driver also have to give if two cars are provided first car standard amount as per calculation second car assume that it is fully used for personal purpose two cars if it is at personal purpose and that personal purpose calculation will come apart from that gas electricity water supply fully taxable servant provided by employer for the house fully taxable any other perquisite fully taxable which are the ones fully exempt telephone bill mobile bill reimbursement reimbursed by employer scholarship to employees children fully exempt if any goods which are like stock in trade like you are an employee of tata cha and tata is giving you packets of tea at reasonable rate no problem fully exempt tax on non monetary perquisite paid by the employer so if your salary is 10 lakh and your perquisite extra is 2 lakh and the employee says i will not pay on this 2 lakh i will not pay tax on this 2 lakh i will take my entire income as 12 lakh but i will not pay tax on 2 lakh so i will have to compute the full tax on 12 lakh only but then minus the tax paid on 2 lakh by the employer i should subtract that's why it says under 10 10 cc tax on non monetary perquisite paid by employer is fully exempt for the employer what will happen he should pay first of all 10 lakh then he should pay 2 lakh he should pay tax on that 2 lakh and the tax portion also will be disallowed under section 37 and all those things 40 tax portion 40a it will be disallowed small a but that also you should pay tax on that that you leave yes next professional tax it's a state government tax it is paid by the employer add to the statement taxable and then deduction under section 16 paid by the employee directly take deduction under section 16 for the employee because i'll pay the employee uh, employee employee will pay on his own the different thing concept number 17 is entertainment allowance it is only for government employees fully taxable for all employees but deduction under section 16 is allowed to government employee For this, twenty percent of basic salary, 
actual amount received or maximum 5000 rupees for all employees standard deduction 50000 rupees or salary per annum whichever is less this is for standard deduction 50000 or salary per annum whichever is less now this is also important because in finance act 2023 they have made the alternate tax regime 115 BAC alternate tax regime difference libraries in that standard deduction etc they have changed little bit which means last time ever these things can come will be number 23 attempt VRS compensation VRS compensation least of the following will be exempt salary per month into number of years of completion fraction to be ignored into three years of service Salary per month into number of remaining months of service. This is if you take voluntary retirement. Actual amount received, maximum amount 5 lakh. Maximum amount 5 lakh. And what is salary? Basic plus DA if it is part of the terms and turnover commission. Then retrenchment compensation as I already told you, we have seen 15 by 26 and all those things. Now, one more thing. NPS that is the pension scheme, new pension scheme. Generally, if you make a full withdrawal of the new pension scheme, employee, non-employee, whatever it is, 40% is taxable, 60% is exempt. If you make a full withdrawal from the NPS scheme. If you make a partial withdrawal, or the if you are an employee, 25% is exempt, 75% is taxable. And if you are a non-employee, 100% is taxable. Now you have rent, uh, RPF, you have ASF, Approved Superannuation Fund and NPS. NPS is taxable as we have seen. RPF up to 12% is exempt. And ASF, Approved Superannuation Fund, up to 7,5,000 rupees is exempt. This is all employer's contribution. So what Nirmala Madam did, she added all the three. And all the three, if the employer's contribution is coming up to more than 7,50,000 rupees, then excess will be taxable as perquisite. Excess will be taxable as perquisite. So, RPF up to 12% is exempt. So, beyond 12% if it is, it's anyway taxable. But even up to 12% is coming up to whatever it is within the limit. Right? So, for instance, here, salary is 50 lakh. RPF is 10%. ASF is 2 lakh, NPS is 60,000. You see, what is 10% of 50 lakh? 5 lakh. Is it well within the limit? Yes. Will it be taxed in our RPF? No. ASF up to 2 lakh, um, up to 7 lakh, 50,000 is exempt anyway. ASF superannuation fund, how much I am giving? 2 lakh. NPS 60,000. How much am I paying overall? 5 lakh plus 2 lakh plus 60,000. 7 lakh 60. Is it exempt within those laws? Yes. But here, 5 lakh plus 2 lakh plus 60,000 is 7 lakh 60. 7 lakh 50 is exceeding by how much? 10,000. So, they have added 10,000 also as perquisite. 10,000 also as perquisite. So, as I told you regarding that amendment in RPF, if the interest on accumulated balance 8% I was earning, accumulated balance was 60 lakh. What is 8%? 4 lakh 80, fully exempt. This is as on 31st March 21. But from 1st April 21, what has happened? I should see. Employer contribution, employee contribution. Employer contribution, 4 lakh into 8%, 32,000, fully exempt. The new amendment is only for the employee contribution. And you see, employee contribution in excess of 2 lakh 50,000 only is taxable. So, if it is 4 lakh rupees, 2 lakh 50 into 8 percent, 20,000 rupees is exempt. The balance 4 lakh minus 2 lakh 50, 1 lakh 50,000 into 8 percent, 12,000 now is taxable. 12,000 is taxable. On the other hand, if there was no employer contribution and my salary was 70 lakh. 10% was my contribution. What is my contribution? 7 lakh. 
and as I told you, up to 5 lakh exempt. More than 5 lakh. How much is it? 2 lakh into 8 percent. 16,000 rupees. Taxable or not taxable? Taxable. That would be taxable. Standard deduction, all that is fine. Then connected to this, I will just quickly go to the 115 BAC and then we will just take a break. So, 115 BAC is the alternate tax, I will just go through the tax rates, that is all. And mind you, whatever 115 BAC concept has come, that has now from the next year onwards, this has become the, that is from Finance Act 23, this has become the default tax regime. Hence, the whatever we did the slab rate, that is the main tax regime only for November 23 attempt. And mind you, this also has changed in Finance Act 23 slabs. So, this slab also last time can come only in November 23. Because these slab rates also have changed slightly. So, this is an option. This is for same for normal citizen, senior citizen, super senior citizen, everything same. Up to 2,50,000, nil. From 2,50,000 to 5 lakh, 5%. 5 5 lakh to 7 lakh 50, 10 percent, 7 lakh 50 to 10 lakh, 15 percent, 10 lakh to 12 lakh 50, 20, 12 lakh 50 to 15 lakh, 25, above 15 lakh, 30 percent. Similar to the normal provision, surcharge applicability also depends on the total income of the SSE, surcharge of 15, 10, 15, 25, 37, all that will apply. Rebate under 87A also which provides for 100 percent tax rebate, whichever is lower, yes, this also will apply, how much, same, 12,500, if it does not exceed 5 lakh, this also has changed, which means this is the last time they can give in November 23, I am not going to tell you what has changed, I mean, what is the change, but I will tell you what has changed, third point has changed, so last attempt, November 23. This slab rate also has changed. So, last attempt, number 23. So, certain deductions and exemptions are not permitted. So, LTC you will not get, HRA you will not get, all special allowances you will not get. Standard deduction of 50,000 you will not get this also guys, this point where they have told standard deduction also you will not get, last time number 23. Nirmal auntie has changed it little, I will not tell you what is the change, definitely no, let us not get you confused, but I am just trying to tell you these are all the last time. House property that, so these are what? These are all the restrictions on individuals to avail deductions are otherwise available. The list of restricted exemptions are as under. You will not get house property that 24B interest on loan also. Additional depreciation you will not get in PGBP. Depreciation you will get, mind you. Additional depreciation you will not get. Deduction for scientific research, etc. you will not get. Capital expenditure 35 AD you will not get. Allowance of income for minor or clubbing, 1500 rupees that you will not get. Then ATC to ATU you will not get, except ATCCD2, that is deduction to employer's contribution to NPS, that you will get. ATJJA, that is employment of new employees you will get ATLA, you will get, apart from that nothing, but you will get the normal allowances, 
gratuity you will get pension you will get vrs you will get retrenchment compensation you will get leave encashment you will get superannuation fund all this you will get exemptions are available as part of employee retirement benefit so that time somebody asked you a asked a question employees contribution but eligible as deduction under 115 bsc under atc deduction you will not get that's for sure but gratuity etc see your question was if employee has contributed to rpf etc earlier if in normal tax regime atc you will get will you get atc now no but what about gratuity pension vrs retrenchment employee benefit that you will you get yes for sure you will get all these things so that's about it guys very simple so we'll take a break it's 12:26 12:40 tak we'll take a break and after which we will do tds tax deducted at source done online people are you here tds again very important definitely they will ask in the exam 12:45 you take 15 minutes 15 16 minutes 12:45 sharp will start tds
Okay. So uh, now coming to the TDS portion, tax deducted at source. So TDS, as the name itself suggests, is the tax that you will be deducting at the source itself. This is a recovery mechanism by the government because people will never pay taxes. So that's why at the beginning only at the source itself they will recover. So the first one is what 192. So generally everything, if we understand who's the payer, who's the pay, etc., then it will be easy. Of course, we'll do all the important areas, uh, all the important TDS sections we'll do. So 192, payer is an employee, pay is a resident or non-resident. Rate will be slab rate, this is salary, that's why. So what all should the employees, uh, employer should consider what all in this? First, he should consider the house property, profit or loss, and then the income from other sources. Income will be considered, loss will not be considered. So if for example, any employee's salary is 80,000 assume uh, per month, 9,60,000. The employer only has to deduct the standard deduction of 50,000 and 9,10,000 will be your income. And then his total tax for that will be, uh, here after doing all the calculation including CES, will be 98,280. So the employer has to deduct 98,280 divided by 12 every single month. So here, the person who is deducting tax will be the employer. He is deducting on, on behalf of the employee. And the best part is, if the employer doesn't deduct, he will be liable as a, a SSE in default. So it's a very dangerous provision for the employer. On the other hand, if you are, what do you say, uh, saying that, as I told you in the previous example, 7 lakh is my, in the example which we saw, uh, you know, in uh, the uh, salaries, if my salary is 7 lakh, 2 lakh is my non-monetary perquisite. And I say that I don't want to pay tax on non-monetary perquisite. I should compute the tax normally only. Overall 9 lakh minus 50,000, 8 and a half lakh. For 8 and a half lakh, 85,800 is the, uh, this thing, tax. Now I told you I will not pay on this 2 lakhs. I will not pay on 2 lakhs is what the employee is saying. So for 8 lakh 50,000 salary, 85,800 is the tax. For 2 lakh rupees, what would be the tax? So for 2 lakh rupees, tax would be 20,000 rupees 188. This 20,188 is borne and also paid by the employer. It is borne by the employer and paid by the employer also. So this amount of 20,188 is disallowed for the employer under PGBP. And for the employee, it is exempt under 1010 CC, which we just saw now. And what should the employee take? Employee, he will, I mean, employer, how much will he deduct? 85,800 minus 20,188. Because it's 20,188, fully they will only pay. Balance 65,612 divided by 12. So, 5468 will be the deduction every single month. So, that is all. And what if this fellow works uh, some, in some, uh, what do you say, cases he will work uh, for six months somewhere and then goes to the other six months somewhere else. So when he is doing that first six months only, they would have taken into account the basic exemption limit, etc. So that again, benefit will not be given to the next six months. So that is what you should calculate. What if I am deriving salary from both two sources? That is possible. Part time, both part time I am working. Both of them know that I am working part time in two companies. It's not a case where I have lied to one company. In this case, I should take the basic exemption limit, give the details only in one company because I cannot take basic exemption limit twice. So, that is all the basic deal in 192. Then, let us check the important ones. So, many things are there in TDS. We will just see the most important areas. Of course, first one is definitely 192, which we have seen. All that we have checked that. Yes. Then, payment of accumulated balance in EPF to employee. This is an important section because it has been amended in Finance Act 2023, which means... The last part ever, this can come is number 20, which part that also I will tell you. This is what I told you in RPF when we are discussing, I told you that you will, all the money that you are getting lump sum will be exempt if four conditions are satisfied. What are the four conditions? You are continuous service of five years you have done. 
or you are exited before five years only because of your ill health or because of your um, the closure of business. So, or other causes due to the what do you say beyond the control of the employee. Now, premature withdrawal, you know, has happened. That is still okay. But if any of for these reasons it is not happening and directly you have done a taxable premature withdrawal, then what happens? Then you will have to pay tax. That is less than five years you have taken a premature withdrawal, but you are not ill. You are fine only. And then you or the business of the SSC has not closed down. It's fine only, but you only left. Or you have not joined somewhere else and you have not shifted the balance there. In that case, it will be taxable. So that is the scene. If generally it is taxed at what time? At the time of payment only. At the time of payment. Generally, TDS is deducted or rather paid at what time? It is deducted at the time of payment or credit, whichever is earlier. Either at the time of payment or credit, whichever is earlier. But some cases it is only on payment basis. One is salary. Salary is only at the time of payment, dividend, all these things, payment. TDS is always at a flat rate. There is no success, no surcharge, etc. except salary for a non-resident. In salary for a non-resident, I will take into account or even normal salary also, I will take into account the surcharge, etc. because I don't want the employee to pay again. Now, there is a general section. If you do not pay, I mean, if you do not furnish your PAN, then the tax rate will be 20%. But one big exception is 192A. If employee does not furnish the PAN, tax will be deducted under the maximum marginal rate, 42.74. Now, this has changed in Finance Act 23. What is the change and all? Let's not go there. But this seventh point, last time ever, it can come only in November 23. Right? They can ask an MCQ where if you don't furnish the PAN under 192A, then the tax will be, first will be double, they'll give 20%. Then they'll say double. Then they'll say 42.744%. So answer is 42.744%. For May 24 onwards, this will change. Yes, next is interest on security, any person paying interest and the payee here will be a resident person, rate will be 10%. This is the TDS on any interest, it says any interest on securities. So securities can be anything for that matter, that is your interest on debentures, interest on other securities, interest on government securities, etc. But TDS is not applicable for certain cases, that is public company is giving interest on debentures to resident individual or HUF. If it is paying less than or equal to 5000 by check, then no TDS. So they will give you, they are paying 7000 by check, TDS will come. They will say 4000 by cash, TDS will come. So it is less than or equal to 5000 by check. Next, payment made to Life Insurance Corporation, General Insurance Corporation, any insurance company. So, if its payment is not made by, it is made to, mind you. And any dematerialized security, this will come. And government security, again MCQ question. Government security for state government or central government, TDS will not come except these two. 8% savings bond account, 7.75% savings taxable bond scheme account. Where the interest is more than 10,000 rupees. Interest is more than 10,000 TDS will come. TDS will come. Then under 54 EC, if you remember in capital gain, we had uh, deposited funds in some account called 54 EC. So that is only two cases there it will be exempt, no TDS. That is for capital gain bonds issued by Power Finance Corporation Limited and Indian Railway Finance Corporation Limited. So for Power Finance and Indian Railway Finance Corporation, it will not come. So those are some important areas, 92A we saw. 194 is your uh, dividend, TDS on dividend, earlier dividend used to be 
dividend distribution tax corporate dividend tax used to be paid by company and then for employee it used to be exempt sorry for the shareholder it used to be exempt now shareholder has to pay under 194 when i am distributing money to the shareholder company only will deduct tds under 194 mind you only if the dividend is more than 5000 dividend is less than 5000 no tds less than or equal to 5000 no tds and it should not be paid by cash and as we know under 206 double uh, a if pan is not furnished then generally it is 10 percent but if pan is not furnished 20 percent 20 percent One ninety four A. Any person other than individual or chef pay will be a resident person. Resident person. This payer of the interest. This is what guys. Interest other than interest on securities. This will be interest on your recurring recurring deposits, etc. This will be interest on your recurring deposits and uh, fixed deposit and all these things. So here. Generally, what is the rate? That's all okay. That is 10%, otherwise 20%, all that okay. But when will TDS not come? If it is paid by bank, corporate society, post office, less than or equal to 40,000 rupees per annum per bank. This is for normal people. For resident senior citizen, less than or equal to 50,000 rupees per bank, per annum per bank. Mind you, it is not per branch. It is per bank. So, all branches added. And if they say uh, non resident senior citizen, for him it is still 40k. Whether 50k limit is only for a resident senior citizen. In other cases, it is less than or equal to 5000 rupees per annum, no TDS. Savings bank interest, no TDS irrespective of any amount. So, which means this 194A is only for recurring deposit, fixed deposit, etc. Firm is paying interest on capital or interest on advance to a partner, no TDS. Interest paid to bank, corporate society, finance corporation, LIC, no TDS, which means I am paying interest, I have taken a loan from bank, I am paying interest to bank, in 194A comes, should I deduct? No. Why in minor where parents are deceased, TDS will be in the hands of the minor, this is also an interesting point. And now interest paid by income tax department on income tax refund. So refund they delayed, so they have to pay interest. Will there be TDS? No TDS. There will be no TDS. Then 194B is for lottery and crossword. 194BB will be for horse race. These cases, payer or payee. So TDS rate is given under this section. Whereas chargeability is given under one more section called 115 BB. So, what is the rate given? 194 B. How much is charged? When is it Im immediately deducted? That is given under 115 BB. So, payer or payee can be any person. Rate will be 30 percent. Only if the winnings is more than 10,000 rupees. If payee is a resident, then no cess. If payee is a non-resident, then cess at 4 percent plus applicable surcharge also will be there. Otherwise, generally TDS, no cess. Why will I charge cess for uh, non-resident? Because I am paying the money, it will never come back later. So, that's why I should deduct the cess and surcharge. However, if I have received a BMW car in, in, a, in a lottery and the amount is 1 crore, now I cannot, you know, deduct TDS. I cannot give one steering tire and all that. So, what is the government telling? You collect from that fellow only. So, you will say, sir, please pay 30 lakh, take the BMW car 1 crore, as simple as that. Or if it is a cash award and uh, other thing, then they will say, take the cash, cash award fully, I will recover towards CDS, extra amount you pay. That is what it is. So, that is the entire thing. 194B and BB. So, one more interesting thing in 194B and BB, if you see, this will also include, this is winning from lottery and crossword puzzle, okay. 194BB is for horse racing or for arranging for wager or betting in any race course. So, this there was confusion whether it included online games or no online games. So, for online games, they made a separate section that is for Finance Act 23 onwards. 
So if they want to give online games, etc., this will still come under these things only 194B and BB because B will include lottery, crossword puddle, or other games of similar sort. So even online games will be like a like Rummy online Rummy and all will be like online lottery in any other mode. So all that will come under 194B only for November 23 exam. For May 24 exam, they have already shifted the section with some other differences elsewhere. Right? So for November 23 exam, online games will still come under 194B. Because 194B section says lottery or crossword puzzle or other game of similar sort. So online also will be similar sort only. So insurance commission, lottery and all these things, ticket commission. 194D is insurance commission, 194D is lottery. That is people in Kerala will sell lottery tickets. No, that commission if they are getting, that is 194G. So both similar concept only 5% but the commission should paid should be more than 15,000 rupees per annum. 15,000 rupees per annum. Then on brokerage, commission on brokerage, any person other than individual or HOF, pay will be a resident person, again the rate will be 5%, it should be more than 15,000 per annum. Anyway, but the real deal is 194C, 194J, 194I, 194M, all those are important areas, that is what we will cover now. 194C, TDS on contractors, who is the payer, any person other than individual or HF will be the considered as the payer. Pay will be any resident person, pay will be any resident person. So, for example, if I am giving you a contract worth 1 lakh rupees, you are the contractor, I am the contractee. When the contractee is paying the money, you should deduct TDS and pay to the contractor. It will be for individual or HF it is 1%, for other persons it is 2%. TDS will be deducted either if the single contract exceeds 30,000 or aggregate contracts exceed 1 lakh. If it is like 30,000, 20,000, 20,000, 40,000, oh sorry, 25,000, 10,000 like that, overall it is exceeding 1 lakh, so in the last payment time I will deduct for the entire year. Now, will 194C apply to, what do you say, individual and HF, means if individual and HF hires a contractor, should he also pay, it depends on, he should be a big individual or HF. So, contractee, payer or deductor, individual plus HF. If the turnover or gross assets is less than or equal to 1 crore, so basically guys, here, very simple, if the deductor or payer or contractee is an individual or HF, we have to follow the chart now, if he is any other than individual like a company etc, then I should see the contract amount, per contract more than 30k or aggregate more than 1 lakh. Now coming to individual HF which is this chart we will see. Now if the turnover or gross assets is less than or equal to 1 crore or less than or equal to 50 lakhs in the profession, no TDS irrespective of the contract amount. In 194C it will not come. On the other hand, if the turnover or gross assets is more than 1 crore and or in case of uh, profession it is 50 lakh more, then only 194C gets triggered. So, will TDS provisions apply, should the individual or HF deduct TDS, it depends on whether he is a big individual or a small individual, who is a big individual, whose turnover or gross assets is more than 1 CR and I mean in case of business or 50 lakh in case of profession, 194C gets triggered. Now, it gets triggered, but I need to see if he is using it for personal purposes or if he is using for official purposes. Let us assume he is using it for official purposes. Like Virat Kohli is hiring a contractor. Is he a big individual? 100% yes. So, he is hiring a contractor for official purposes. Single payment more than 30k, aggregate payment more than 1 lakh, 194c. Very simple. At what rate? 1% if that pay is an individual or 2% if the pay is other than an individual. So, Virat Kohli is hiring 
uh, you know somebody for let's say some training of his calf muscles is hiring a trainer official purpose is hiring an individual how much is deducting one person he should deduct he is charging he is paying them 12 lakhs per annum how much should he deduct one person but he is hiring a company where they will keep sending every day one one trainer so how much they deduct one two percent on the other hand virat kohli hires an interior designer for his house right interior designer for his house and he is paying them 20 lakh rupees for his entire some one room not even a house one room he wants an interior designer fully designing his interior uh, his uh, his one room which is let's say study library he wants to design he is given it to an interior designer that female is charging 20 20 lakh rupees now payment to a resident contractor per year is it less than or equal to 150 uh, 50 lakhs yes so 194c also will not come is one more section 194m that also will not come but if he is paying to a resident contractor per financial year more than 50 lakh so virat kohli hires a interior designer for his room and paying 60 lakh rupees to that person so then 194c will not come because it's personal purpose but 194M will come. Another section 194M, TDS will be at the rate of 5%. Now, what do you mean by contract? Contract can be contract of work, contract can work of labor, or it can be service. Service can be professional service, technical service, managerial service. Professional, technical, managerial service, etc. will not come under 194C, it will come under 194J. But as far as work and labor is concerned, work and labor is concerned, it will include everything, advertisement, it includes broadcasting, it includes telecasting, cold storage facility, which we saw in specified business under 35 AD, that also will come under this, carriage of goods or passengers other than Indian railways, anything carriage of goods or passengers, if you are hiring a lorry, if you are hiring a goods carriage, if you are hiring FedEx plane to carry your stuff, goods, yes, definitely it will come. Catering services, it will come. Transportation of gas or petroleum uh, stuff also will come. If you are manufacturing any product as per the client's requirement, that also will come under 194C. Advertisement, like, you know, any advertisement which is hosted everywhere will come for sure. And what about telecasting, broadcasting? For example, Netflix originals you would have seen in netflix originals they are only the producers they will hire a cast crew etc they will tell them boss this is the script this is how i want it i am the producer do it as per that that's it now is this a, is that a contract yes because they are hiring everybody script story writer etc 994c will come on the other hand netflix buys the right of let's say rrr movie is RRR made for Netflix? No. But they have bought the Hindi rights of RRR movie. Is that a contract? No. It's an outright sale. So for outright sale, 194C will not come. Carriages. If I have hired, hired a goods carriage of 35,000 rupees, can I pay cash? Yes, I can pay cash. Why? Because we had seen in 40A3, for goods carriages up to 35,000, no, no, what do you say? Uh, you can pay by cash also, no need of bank payment. However, now this section says up to 35,000 rupees, no problem, you can pay. If the individual is owning less than or equal to 10 trucks and is given a declaration and is furnished a span, then there is no TDS for that person. No TDS for that person. So for goods carriage, three conditions, irrespective of the amount. I told the 35,000 only for cash purposes. You pay 1 lakh, 2 lakh, 3 lakh also, no problem. No TDS. No 40A3 disallowance for payer if amount paid in cash is less than or equal to 35,000. This is connecting 40A3 and 192. Sorry, 194C. Right? So, if I am paying to a goods carriage guy, owning less than or equal to 10 trucks, any amount paid, 1 lakh, 2 lakh, 3 lakh, no TDS, provided he should own less than or equal to 10 trucks and he should give a declaration and he should furnish a plan. 
very very simple goods carriage other than goods carriage ship airway school bus and all those things 194c will come because this is only talking about goods carriage not about passenger manufacture of a product on the other hand if the materials are supplied by customer only i will supply a jewel worth 10 lakhs and i will ask you to work on that designing i will give you a hard jewel you will have to work designing and give me when you give me the bill people used to give 14 lakh 15 lakh bill 5 lakh is the working charges 10 lakh is the jewel tds had to be applicable on the full amount because you had not separated it that's why the government told kindly separate material cost separate work cost separate if you separate like that and give you will only be charging tds on the work portion in my example 5 lakhs to avoid this this is materials customer supplied by customer to avoid this what people were doing they were asking the related party to supply the jewel if i want a jewel i'll ask my father to supply the jewel if i am a company i'll ask my holding company to supply the jewel like that i was doing cheating because in that case no tds why because materials are not supplied by customer it is supplied by somebody else so an amendment came even if it is supplied by an associate of the customer as defined under 40a2 then it is deemed to be material supplied by customer and same provisions will apply but if it is supplied some some random third party so i will go to tanishk and say i want this design so they will buy from somebody else they will get it designed from somebody else and they will sell it to me what tds when i am paying tanishk should i deduct tds no it's an outright sale so that is regarding 194c as far as gas or petroleum is concerned let's say indian oil corporation is uh, sending the producing gas and sell, sending the gas to your factory now the question is i have hired some trucks to transport the gas if i own the trucks then it's sale but if i hired the trucks even though the trucks i have rented the trucks out every day but those trucks are in my premises always they'll be in my factory always it's as if i own the trucks but i have taken it on a contract hence the law in the court case it was there they said it is 194c it is 194c next coming to 194 i rent any person other than individual or hf but individual or hf that is big individual also has to pay 194 i individual turnover is more than 1 crore gross receipts and profession more than 50 lakh tds is required p will be a resident person what is it rent for building land or both or furniture or fix fixtures 10% plant and machinery and equipment 2% aggregate amount should be more than 2 lakh 40000 rupees per annum aggregate amount more than 2 lakh 40000 rupees per annum rent what are the adjustments in the exam rent can be lease sublease tenancy agreement arrangement everything rent can be maintenance charges it can be municipal taxes municipal taxes paid by tenant no tds municipal taxes paid by owner or included in rentals everything 194 i will come because municipal taxes paid by the owner here and included in the rentals so 194 i will come on that because it's part of the rent but municipal tax paid by tenant himself no tds then if you want to take warehousing charges cold storage units i already told you it will come under 194 c it will not come under 194 i but normal warehouse will come under 194 i if i have partly hired a building or land law maker uses the word any land or any building hence 194 i will come if i have paid an advance rent for 3 years let's say every year is 6 lakh i have paid advance rent of 6 lakh into 3 18 lakhs 3 years so 1.8 lakh tds will be apportioned across 3 years 60000 per annum if rent joint owner you know uh, rent is paid 3 lakh rupees but it is paid 1.5 lakh to one person 1.5 lakh to the other person mr a and mr b no tds why i should take per person there deposit refundable deposit if i have taken interest bearing deposit 194 i will not come 194 a will come because interest is given there non interest bearing deposit no tds if it's a non refundable deposit then 194 i will come because again it is 
non refundable as such it is deemed to be rent airport mall all these uh, you know uh, food uh, people who hire like any like for example subway has or california burrito has hired a space in an airport or a mall to sell their stuff food stuff that is 194 right on the other hand the airlines have to pay some landing charges parking charges to airports authority of india is that rent of land yes it was d or is it like 194c or 194i so they said since it involves many things traffic services safety services your uh, aeronautical communication navigational services it will come under 194c and not 194i similarly from the passenger they will collect something called cute fee common user terminal equipment fee then passenger service fee metal detectors escalator conveyor belt all these things in jet airways case they told it is 194c and not 194i i am not renting the space i am giving all these services similarly there will be a house on the house there will be a telecom tower right so on the telecom tower the telecom tower is uh, you know some company owns that tower they will be paying rent to the owner is it 194i yes but this telecom tower that passive infrastructure facility they will give it to various people they will give it to airtel jio and all these people now is that 194i or 194c it went to the court they said it is renting of machinery and it will come under 194i what rate 2% it will come at 2% rate these are all the various examples you can give then any long term lease 20 years lease 30 years is where you have to refund that after 20 years then that is not rent no tds hotel accommodation if i fix two rooms for 8 months at a fixed rate regular rate whether i come there or not come there it's already fixed two rooms already ready for me for 8 months 194i because regularly hired on the other hand if i strike a deal with you whenever i come you should give me this rate i may come i may not come also but i will assure you i may come for around one month but it's not sure but if i come you should give me this rate that is arrangement for a discounted rate no 194 i will come because it's an arrangement at the end of the day you would have seen lot of holdings billboards etc outside if i had made a direct deal with the owner then it's an advertisement contract under 194 c otherwise it will be like a subletting basically i own the I have taken on rent that particular billboard and I am renting it out to you. Then it will be under 194i. Zoom car, etc. Drive C without chauffeur, without driver, without fuel, whatever self drive vehicle if I am taking, 194i will come. On the other hand, if I am hiring Ola Cabs taxi agency, so a company enters into a contract with Ola Cabs for supplying, what do you say, some 10 cabs every day to ferry there employees that will come under 194c now 194ia is there that is what if you are buying a house in the future and if it is happening to be more than 50 lakh rupees then you have to deduct tds this will be at one percent of either the sale consideration or sdv and it should be more than 50 lakh rupees to be more than 50 lakh rupees and in immobile property rural agricultural land is not covered rural agricultural land is not covered but urban agricultural land if it is more than 50 lakh rupees then it will be covered 100 percent it will be covered coming to 194 j 194J is for professional, technical and managerial services. Professional, technical and managerial services. What is the rate of tax in 194J? What percentage? Let me come to that. Yeah. 2% in case of technical services not being professional services if it is royalty for sale distribution or exhibition of cinematographic films two percent if it is engaged in the business of call center only two percent in any other case ten percent so two percent only in three cases 
technical services not being professional services second one royalty for sale distribution or exhibition of cinematographic films and third one business of call center then it is 2% in all other cases 10% But if you see, it is also applicable for a person, 194J is also applicable for a person, deductor whose income is more than 1 crore turnover or profession 50 lakh. So interesting to know, if he is hiring professional services, if he is providing professional services, hiring professional services, aggregate value less than or equal to 50 lakh, 194M will not come, 194J also will not come, but if it is more than 50 lakh, 194J will not come. But since he is a big individual, 194M will come. But if he is hiring technical services, if it is less than or equal to 50 lakh also, more than 50 lakh also, 194M will not apply. 194M will not apply. If the value of the service is more than 30,000, then 194J will apply. Because in professional service, technical service, etc., it is what 30,000 is the amount 30,000 in a year mind you 194J is for the following payments P for professional services P for technical services royalty for that movie etc non-compete fee non-compete fee we had seen in 28 5A that is do not share the know-how do not work elsewhere work only here be a full-time consultant that is called non-compete fee 28 5A and any remuneration or fee or commission to a director of the company other than those covered under the head salary. This is your sitting fee. Sitting fee. What should be the amount guys? More than 30,000. One interesting question they can ask you. Director got a sitting fee of 29,000 rupees. Will TDS apply? Director got a sitting fee of 29,000 rupees. Will TDS apply? TDS will apply because that 30,000 rupees limit is only for 1, 2, 3, 4. That's it. No TDS if the amount does not exceed 30,000. Above limit is only for 1 to 4. For sitting fee, entire sum will be subject to TDS without any limits without any limits entire sum shall be subject to tds without any limits So, professional services means legal, medical, engineering, architecture or any profession of accountancy, etc. It will also include sports persons, umpires and referees, coaches and trainers, team physicians, event managers, etc. The payment to Arsha Bogle will be under 194J. Payment to Matthew Hayden will not be under 194J because 194J is only for residents. So, payment to Matthew Hayden will be under 195 foreign taxation. Sports person, payment to Virat Kohli, 194J. Payment to Josh Butler, not under 194J. Payment to an Indian Empire, 194J. Foreign Empire, 195. So, all that you need to see. So, any payment made to software, etc., there will be no TDS if you have just bought the software and selling it to India. When I bought the software, I would have paid anyway TDS. Then I am selling it to other people. But if I buy the software, make some changes in it and then sell, for both the transactions, TDS will come. One, buying from abroad. Second, selling it to you, TDS will come. So that is regarding software. Then for third party administrators like insurance companies, if HDFC Ergo is an insurance company, 
there will be a third party administrator separate service provider in the hospitals so if you fall sick you will have to go to the third party administrator they will directly settle payment to the hospital because hospital cannot wait for longer no you will have to be discharged only if you make payment you will be discharged so the third party administrator will directly make payment to the hospitals and they will take money from hdfc or go later the question is when the third party administrator is making payment to the hospitals will 194j come because hospital has provided what service professional service this is medical service the issue went to court then lot of circulars came they said yes instead of insurance company who is giving third party the third party administrator has to deduct tds while paying making payment to hospitals they have to make payment to hospitals that is regarding 194 j also very very simple then we will see certain things here this is my One ninety four O. Very simple. E-commerce operator, you have Amazon, etc. And in Amazon, you will have both seller as well as buyer, as we know. Seller is called as e-commerce participant. Amazon is the e-commerce operator, can be resident or non-resident, and buyer can be anybody. Now the question is. seller is selling goods and services to the e-commerce operator and then going to the buyer buyer will pay money and issue is closed when the e-commerce operator is giving money to the seller should he deduct tds is the question answer is yes under 194o mind you seller must be a resident in india and he is the pay what should be transferred here goods and services and e commerce operator can be resident or non resident what is the tds rate 1% of the gross amount of sales 1% of the gross amount of sales not net amount nothing full whatever amount is sold that full amount will come under this so sony india is selling tvs to chroma and chroma is selling to buyer And when Chroma is making payment to one, uh, Sony India, one ninety four O will come. Sony Japan is selling TVs through Chroma. When Chroma is making selling to buyer, when Chroma is making payment to Sony Japan, one ninety four O will not come because the pay must be a resident in India. So here one ninety five will come. Sony India is selling TVs to Walmart USA. Definitely 194 O will come because Walmart USA can be resident or non-resident doesn't matter. But individual, if he is selling less than 5 lakh rupees, 194 O will not come. So if an individual is selling some perfume through Amazon and it's 4 lakh 95 thousand rupees, payment made to individual 4 lakh 95 thousand, it will not come. On the other hand, if you are a partnership firm, the exemption is only for whom individuals, not for partnership firm. That is the gist of one ninety four O. Next is one ninety four Q. One ninety four Q is for the big buyer of the goods. For the big buyer of the goods. So P. is a seller is a resident he is selling goods not services selling goods to value more than 50 lakh to a buyer who is a buyer who is a deductor he can be a resident or non resident who has a permanent establishment in india and i told you 194 q is for big buyer of goods so turnover or gross assets from business should be more than 10 crore in the immediately preceding financial year big buyer so if a seller is selling more than 50 lakh to a big buyer 
TDS has to be deducted under 0.1% of the sum exceeding 50 lakh. 0.1% of the sum exceeding 50 lakh. At the time of payment or credit, whichever is earlier. 0.1% of the sum exceeding 50 lakh rupees. That is one part of the story. On the other hand, if you see TCS provisions, TCS is what? Tax collected at source. Tax collected at source. In this, when the buyer is buying and paying money, the seller has to collect then and there only and remit to the government. So we have 206C1, 1C, 1F, 1G, 1H. So 206C1 only talks about TCS at specified rates. Buyer will be any buyer except state government, central government, public sector, company, etc. Seller will be any seller, CG or SG, local authority, corporation, any company, or big sellers, individual HF whose turnover exceeds 1 crore, same dialogue. Now these rates you have to remember, alcoholic liquor for human consumption, 1% if pan is furnished, pan is not furnished, 5%. Tendu leaves, 5%, 10%. Timber obtained under a forest lease, 2.5%. Scrap, 1%, minerals, 1%. You have to remember the rates and the amounts and the uh, nature. 206C1C, this is on certain contracts. What contracts? Parking lot. Nature of contract or license? Parking lot. So, I will give you parking lot license to you. When you are paying the money, I should collect extra TCS. How much? 2%. Toll plaza? 2%. Mining and quarrying? 2%. Motor vehicles? Every person being a seller receives any amount as consideration for sale of motor vehicles value exceeding 10 lakh rupees. Value exceeding 10 lakh rupees. So, buyer will not include state government and all that. Now, TCS applicable only at all retail level sales. So, a Mercedes manufacturer is selling to luxury motor car dealer at 400 crore, TCS under section 2061F will not come. Luxury motor retailer is selling to Mr. PJ, 80 lakhs vehicle, so yes, TCS at 1% will come for more than 10 lakhs. On the other hand, TCS is applicable on sale of any motor vehicle, they never say luxury motor vehicle, any vehicle exceeding 10 lakh, ordinary or luxury. TCS is applicable on each sale of motor vehicle and not the aggregate value of sale during the year. So, if I sell 7 lakh, no TCS. If I sell 6 lakh car, no TCS. It is not on the aggregate value, it is on each sale. But if I sell 60 lakh car, if I buy, but I give different different payments, 5 lakh and 55 lakh, will TCS come on each payment? Yes. Even though this is less than 10 lakhs, you should not say TCS will not apply, TCS will apply. But if I buy different different cars of less than 10 lakhs, TCS will not come. Two zero six C one g important. Why? Finance Act 23 has changed it. So, last time ever these provisions can come is November 23. Remittance outside India and overseas tour program package. Every person being an authorized dealer who received an amount for remittance outside India from the buyer under the LRS, Liberalized Remittance Scheme of the RBI, 
responsible to collect tax from the buyer. So basically, guys, you are an authorized dealer. Somebody will come to you and say, "I need ten lakh rupees INR converted to US dollar. I want to go abroad." Fair enough. Up to seven lakh notice. Yes. Exceeding seven lakh, five percent of such amount in excess of seven lakh. I have to collect TCS extra amount exceeding seven lakh out of education loan from financial institution. Then zero point five percent of amount of seven lakh in excess of seven lakh. So I will go to this authorized dealer that is Western Union money and tra money transfer etc. and say give me twenty lakh education loan. In that seven lakh notice yes extra thirteen lakh. Then how much TCS you have to pay? Zero point five percent TCS for educational loan. I am a overseas tour program package seller. I am Thomas Cook. I am Kesari Tours. I am Chariot Tours. So for them, no threshold limit for any sum. You will give me five lakh rupees for your world tour. I will add five lakh plus five percent on it TCS. I have to pay. Will you get TCS credit? Yes. This is to government should know where you are traveling. That's why they are collecting TCS. That's all. Then comes two zero six C one H. Two zero six C one H is also selling of goods, but here you have a big seller, not big buyer. If you see the other section, was big buyer. One ninety four Q was big buyer. Here it is, big seller. Seller is exp exporter of goods are not covered. Seller to collect TCS. Seller can be resident or non-resident. Buyer can be resident or non-resident. Value is more than fifty lakh. There also value more than fifty lakh only. Here, if you compare, here buyer was resident. S seller was resident. Sorry, buyer can be resident or non-resident. Value more than fifty lakh goods. And big buyer. Here it is, big seller. And seller can be resident, non-resident. Buyer also can be resident, non-resident. No problem. Value should be more than fifty lakh. Same thing, goods. Here, who is a seller? Gross receipts or turnover from business should be more than ten crore in the immediately preceding financial year. Buyer should not be an importer of goods. Buyer should not be state government, central government, etc. Buyer should not be local authority. Buyer can be resident or non-resident. TCS value is zero point one percent of sale consideration more than fifty lakh. If TDS provisions are already applicable, then TCS will not apply, right? That's what it is. That's all regarding TDS, TCS, etc. Then that interconnection and all, you leave it, guys. That is, I they have given in the syllabus, stupid fellows, but no need, right? So, on the other hand, if a luxury motor retailer is selling eighty lakhs, as I told you, to Mr. P J. So here both will come now. One is two zero six C one F also is coming. Two zero six C one H is also coming. So the lawmaker has told TCS under two zero six C one F will come. One H will not come because it's a specific section. We'll override the general section. Then these other cases you can just go through in the notes. Otherwise, not needed. That's about it, guys. That is about TDS, TCS. All the important sections we have anyway covered. Just stick to that. And as I told you, there is a you know what do you say? Two zero six double A. Twenty percent if pan is not furnished. But exceptions are what lottery etc. Rates are anyway higher. So if you don't furnish the pan, furnish the pan. Don't furnish the pan. Tax rate will be thirty percent only. One ninety four O and one ninety four Q. It is five percent. And this is important. One ninety two A. It is forty two point seven four four percent. This is only for November twenty three. 
or it opens and for because that also is changed to 20% later. That's fine. Normally they have made it off. Now it is 742.744%. Cool. So that completes all these areas. Other chiller areas you can go through on your own. That is what your set of carry forward all non chiller chiller items. You can go through then your deductions. Please read deductions also. They are very easy. Just that you have to remember stuff. So we have finished all the heads of income. We have finished uh, TDS is again important and residential status also we have finished. Other smaller areas you can go through on your own. So all the very best return of income and all is very easy guys. So all the best guys. Do well, study well. Right. So see you after the exams and see you in CA final. CA final, this uh, whatever you studied, the father will be there. This 240 hours of classes. Okay. So fine. So online people, thank you for attending. Hope you understood. So all these videos will be uploaded because people are requesting my office calling up. So we'll upload it. No problem. Every day one. So the first video are already uploaded. Second will go today. Third tomorrow. Fourth day after tomorrow will be uploaded. It will be there only on YouTube. You can check out whenever you want. Okay. Thank you so much guys. Take care. All the best. Do well. See you later. Okay. Take care.